show your support, like, share and subscribe. Hello, I am That British Guy and welcome to The Raw After. It has been a few months since I have done one of these videos and what with Wrestlemania now being behind us and my Wrestlegamia series being finished I wanted to use this time to just restructure my schedule a little bit and now I have a lot more free time I can go back to this particular series. For anyone that hasn't seen any of these before basically what I do is look at the episode of Raw after a specific pay-per-view and in this episode I will be looking at the Raw after Wrestlemania 31. We all know what happened at Wrestlemania 31. We saw this. And this. And this. And of course we ended the night like this. So with that being said, what happened on the Raw after. First point to note, Pyro. We still had Pyro. It's 2015 and we still had Pyro. Oh how I miss Pyro. We have Michael Cole, Booker T and JBL on commentary for the moment and I'll explain what that means a little bit later in the video. We open with Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman coming down to the ring and as you can imagine, both of them, especially Lesnar, are rather irritated. In fact, Heyman refers to Lesnar as the most non-PG arse kicker in the PG era. Heyman then describes pretty much exactly move for move what Lesnar did to Reigns the previous night. Suplex, 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 suplex. And we get a suplex city chant from the crowd. This was back when people actually enjoyed suplex city, probably mainly because they really, really didn't like Roman Reigns. Then obviously at the F5 the previous night, that is when Seth Rollins made his way to the ring Curb stomped everybody and pinned Roman Reigns for the title. And Hayman basically brings up the fact that because Seth pinned Roman, he is the least deserving champion in anybody's lifetime. His idea then is basically to take WWE to task legally and get the title held up in litigation and essentially nullify Seth Rollins' title reign. But he explains that because Lesnar thinks that every single lawyer is a scumbag, he has a better plan, and that is to cash in his rematch. So for the first time in over a decade, Heyman promises that Lesnar will be competing on Monday Night Raw tonight. Stephanie comes out to make this official, but in the midst of her announcement, all we can hear are Ronda Rousey chants. More on that later. We then get a quick announcement that John Cena has issued a United States Open Challenge. This is obviously the beginning of that big Open Challenge that he did for weeks and weeks once he won the United States Championship before dropping it later in the year to Seth Rollins. So that match will be coming up later and it is strongly hinted that he will be facing Rusev, the man he took the United States Championship from. Our first match is a title match of a different type. Daniel Bryan, the new Intercontinental Champion, will be defending against Dolph Ziggler. Now this is basically because Dolph Ziggler had two victories over Daniel Bryan the previous week and these were the last two guys at the top of the ladder when the match was won essentially. Daniel Bryan had to kind of get rid of Ziggler just before taking the title and the previous champion Bad News Barrett is at ringside on guest commentary. And what would have been nice is if especially Booker T and JBL had actually allowed Barrett to speak for longer than say a few words before interrupting him with a name crap. Barrett is very good on the mic. He is very good at not only getting over the match from WrestleMania, getting over this match that's going on himself as well as Brian and Ziggler and playing it all in so that it all makes sense and the fact that these two are basically brutalizing each other and he loves it because inevitably he's going to take his title back from whoever wins this match. 
everything he's saying is making sense, everything he's saying is nice and clear, it fits in with his character, it doesn't degrade anyone involved in either the WrestleMania match or this match here, but all JBL and Booker T keep trying to do is cut him off and ask him inane nothing questions basically or rehash something he's already explained but they weren't really listening to it. The match itself is very competitive, it's Ziggler versus Brian so of course it is. A few nice bits of note, we get a surfboard fairly early on in the match and some of the running knees into the corner from Daniel Bryan. Dolph Ziggler does make a bit of a comeback but he attempts to hit a zigzag Daniel Bryan kind of shrugs him off and goes for a running knee himself, which leaves him open to Ziggler's super kick. After this, we kind of get the double down into a yay boo sequence, which is mainly dealt with by headbutting each other. Nice, interesting take on that sequence, which leads Bryan to kind of dazing Ziggler so that he can hit him with the running knee and pin him for the victory. He gets jumped pretty much immediately by a Bad News Barrett, and then we hear Seamus' music. He runs down to clear Barrett out of the ring, just as you think he's kind of helping both Ziggler and Brian. It's put over that he has kind of a common respect and friendship with those two guys. He bro kicks Daniel Bryan in the face. Ziggler tries to fight back, but he succumbs to white noise and a bro kick as well. Needless to say, this is Sheamus' return since a long injury has put him on the shelf. So this is him basically putting himself in the Intercontinental title picture right from his return. Next up, we get a brief Hall of Fame recap, looking at the ceremony itself and also the guys coming out on the rampway at WrestleMania. Our next match is an eight-man tag match, two heel teams and two face teams. On the heel side of things, we have the Ascension. I cannot believe they've been on the main roster as long as they have. And they're teaming up with the tag team champions, Tyson Kidd and Cesaro. And on the other side, we have the New Day and the fresh arrival from NXT of the Lucha Dragons. And the commentators make sure to play over the history between the Ascension and the Lucha Dragons. The Lucha Dragons actually being the team to end the Ascension's long reign as tag team champions in NXT. And Accolade as longest tag team champions, they still actually hold to this day. That was back when the Ascension were actually good. This is pretty much put together to be a showcase match for the Lucha Dragons. They get a bit of fire at the beginning, but strangely enough, it's actually Sin Cara that gets worked over. Seems a bit odd that they wouldn't use one of the New Day for that. Probably Kofi, seeing as he is the smaller guy. He's in there with Big E, and it's kind of difficult to believe that Tyson Kidd and Cesaro especially would be working over Big E. But it's not Kofi, it's Sin Cara, which is really weird. Anyway, towards the end of the match, Kofi does manage to get into the match, and they essentially work over him after his hot tag, especially Kidd and Cesaro working over Kofi. Victor then blind tags himself in, so we get a little bit of uh, awkward moment between Cesaro and Victor. Kofi uses this as an opportunity to get the hot tag back over to his team and get Kalisto into the match. And after Big E pretty much clears everybody out, Kalisto pins Victor after hitting him with the Selena Del Sol. Backstage, Heyman informs Lesnar that Seth Rollins has finally arrived, so now they will have their title match for the WWE title. We get the ring entrances and announcements as normal, but just as the match is about to start, Rollins explains that he is suffering from jet lag because he has had to go across the country and do announcements and presentations as the new champion, and also his foot hurts because of the curb stomps he had to deliver to Lesnar and Reigns last night. So he backs out of the match and explains that it will have to happen at a later date. Lesnar tries to attack him, but he manages to escape. 
So Lesnar goes totally ballistic, flips the announce table over on top of Booker T and JBL. He then grabs hold of Michael Cole and F5s him in the middle of the ring. Just when you think he is done, he then grabs a cameraman and is about to F5 him when Stephanie McMahon comes out and says to him, look, this needs to stop, otherwise you are going to be suspended. Lesnar being Lesnar, F5s him anyway, and Stephanie indefinitely suspends Lesnar, essentially writing him out of TV for a few months. After the break, we get a bit of a video recap of all of this, and we then cut to an interview with Stephanie McMahon talking to Renee Young backstage, and Stephanie just kind of backs up and reiterates exactly why she has suspended Brock Lesnar and she intends on issuing him with a fine as well for attacking civilians. She then says that if Lesnar thinks he can just waltz back off to MMA then he is very much mistaken as he has just signed a new contract with the WWE so in her words I own that son of a bitch. We get a very quick and pretty pointless match, to be honest, between Stardust and Damien Mizdow. Just as they're making their entrances, we get the recap of Mizdow actually eliminating Miz from the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania. Stardust works over Mizdow for basically the entire match and has to fend off many, many Cody chants from the crowd. But at the end, Mizdow hits the skull crushing finale and pins Stardust. As he does this, Miz comes out, hits the skull crushing finale on Mizdow, and basically is berating him for his actions the night before, stating that he would be nothing if not for the Miz. Now, throughout this episode, there are various recaps of some of the events of WrestleMania the night before. But what is very interesting in this section obviously kind of has some big payoff a couple of years later. We see the whole interaction between Stephanie and Triple H and The Rock and then The Rock going over to the crowd barrier and bringing Ronda Rousey into the ring. And we see the kind of interaction and the physical altercation between Rousey and Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. This then leads on to the various other bits and pieces that the WWE had done over WrestleMania weekend, including sort of charity bits and pieces, access and everything like that. Next up, we have what is essentially a squash match and a showcase for Neville. Remember him. He has a match with Curtis Axel and it's basically to put over all of his offense. It's just strike, 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 completely out of here. There is like a pinball bouncing around the ring, pretty much. He's effectively trying to get a five minute match into a two minute segment. He then hits the red arrow and pins Curtis Axel for the win. It is nice that they put over the fact that he's just come up from NXT and he was the NXT champion there for close to 300 days. After another recap of everything that Lesnar did earlier, we get John Cena's US Open Challenge. And instead of getting Rusev come out, we actually get Dean Ambrose and a very, very tasty match. There is a break very early in the match and Cena kind of has most of the offense up until that point. But when we come back, Ambrose is pretty much on top. And for most of the match, really, Ambrose gets in a lot more offense than Cena. Obviously, this open challenge was designed to try and get other guys involved in high profile matches with Cena to try and put them over in defeat. And this very much happens in this instance with Dean Ambrose. He manages to counter, if that's the right word, out of a you can't see me moment. He then does get hit by it straight afterwards and actually Cena is able to connect with the five knuckle shuffle but Dean Ambrose manages to get back on top of things pretty much straight away. The end of the match is quite frantic. We get an AA and then a kick out because of course everyone kicks out of the AA. Cena immediately tries to then do a super AA from the turnbuckle but Dean manages to fight out with a power bomb. But from this powerbomb, Cena puts Ambrose into an STF. 
After fighting out of this, we get another AA attempt, which Ambrose counters into an STF of his own. And after yet another AA attempt, that gets countered into a Dirty Deeds for a two count. However, ultimately, Dean Ambrose does finally succumb after trying a few other manoeuvres out of the AA. He does get hit by it and goes down for the three count. There is a nice show of respect at the end, though, with a very brief handshake between Cena and Ambrose. Backstage, we have another interview with Renee Young. This time, she's talking to Seth Rollins. And Seth Rollins is basically saying, look, he earned his Money in the Bank briefcase. He was able to cash that in whenever he liked. He is a deserving champion. Randy Orton appears and reminds Seth that at the WrestleMania last night where Seth won the title, he did actually lose to Randy Orton thanks to that curb stomp into an RKO. So, although he doesn't have to worry about Lesnar because he's suspended, he should start worrying about Orton. Big Show and Kane then appear behind Seth and Seth challenges Randy Orton to a six-man tag for the end of the night. Seth, Big Show and Kane versus Randy and whoever he can find because he's got loads of friends, right? Of course, knowing that Randy Orton definitely doesn't. Next up, we have a six diva, six woman tag match. The Bellas and Natalia taking on AJ Lee, Paige and Naomi. Now, the previous night, AJ and Paige managed to beat Nikki and Brie at WrestleMania. And Nikki is in the midst of her Divas title reign where she sets the record for the longest ever title reign. Obviously this is a few months before Charlotte and Becky and Sasha and the whole women's revolution thing happening. And they're very much trying to put over Naomi in this match. She's kind of the youngest, newest member of the roster. She's still coming out to the horrible Brodus Clay Funkadactyl, whatever the hell music that was, rather than having her proper own identity. But this was kind of the beginning of getting her legitimised as a member of the women's division. Naomi starts off the match and it's fairly even. She has a bit of time in the ring with Natalia and Brie Bella. Paige has a brief flurry, but by the time we get back from the break, AJ Lee is in the ring. And it is Nikki, Brie and Natalia, although mainly the Bellas, doing very slow, boring, rest hold stuff over AJ Lee. What is interesting to see, well, I say interesting, bearing in mind this woman was the champion of the women's division, Nikki tries probably the world's worst bow and arrow lock and then tries to transition this into a surfboard and both look absolute crap. After far too long of being worked over by people that really don't know how to do that good a job of working over people, sorry but they don't, AJ manages to tag Naomi in, everybody kind of comes in and it's that whole match breaks down scenario and in the midst of that Nikki accidentally hits Brie in the face Naomi hits her with the rear view and manages to pick up the pin over Nikki Bella. Randy Orton is in the locker room and Ryback appears and basically offers his services for the main event because he wants to get his hands on anybody in the authority. It's time for another squash match, Goldust versus Rusev. Rusev completely destroys Goldust, really. I think Goldust might have maybe got in about four kicks in the entire match and eventually gets Machka kicked in the face and then taps out to the accolade. And throughout the entire match, all Jerry Lawler is basically doing is moaning at the fact that Rusev is an evil foreign heel and doesn't like America. Cool. Finally, we get our main event, Seth Rollins, Kane and The Big Show taking on Randy Orton and Ryback and the other member of that team is Roman Reigns. Booze from the crowd. There is a very early flurry from Ryback, but pretty much as soon as he leaves the ring, 
and especially when Orton is being worked over by Kane and the Big Show, this crowd does not care at all. We get chants of, please retire to the Big Show. We get chants of, we want Brock back for most of the match because they were meant to be getting Brock Lesnar in a title match against Seth Rollins. And you can kind of see, yeah, I'd be cheesed off in that situation. A complete bait and switch with him being completely removed from the show. And we get this really slow, boring, tedious six-man tag with Kane and the Big Show involved with the world champion. They shouldn't be kind of held at that level. Big Show had just won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal as well, so that trophy is at ringside. He didn't need to win that the previous night. A bit later on, we get a Mexican wave, and Byron and Jerry Lawler on commentary are trying to put over that. Well, it's because it's the Raw after WrestleMania. This crowd's wacky. No, it's because you're boring the crowd to tears and they don't care about this match. It even leads to a we are awesome charm. When a crowd is trying to get themselves over, you know you have completely lost them. Anyway, at the end, Roman gets the hot tag. I say hot tag because the crowd really doesn't want him in the ring. And again, we get the complete breakdown and we get finisher after finisher after finisher. We get a Superman punch into a spear from the Big Show. This then leads to a shell shock on the Big Show and a curb stomp on Ryback. And finally, Roman Reigns spears Kane and picks up the victory. Way to put over your new champion and nice and strong. Have his team lose. I know he didn't take the pin, but this was essentially Vince trying to get Reigns back over with the crowd after losing at WrestleMania. It's not going to work, I'm afraid. This crowd doesn't want anything to do with Roman Reigns at this point. You should have worked that out at the Royal Rumble. Let him lose at WrestleMania and park him for a while and see if you can build up other challenges instead. But as we know, that ultimately did not happen. So there we go. That is what happened on the Raw after WrestleMania 31. This is where we got Brock written out for a little while. We got the start of John Cena's US Open Challenge until he drops the belt later in the year to Seth Rollins and he is a double champion. We see Seth Rollins kind of hiding behind the authority as much as is humanly possible. And we see what could have been the beginning of a nice lengthy reign for Daniel Bryan, but ultimately he had to vacate the Intercontinental Championship not long after this. Oh, and Sheamus came back as well, with a really, really weird haircut and beard look. Really odd. Next month I will be changing things up ever so slightly and actually looking at the Smackdown after. Specifically the Smackdown after Extreme Rules 2011 where Christian finally won the world title. But until next time, I have been that British guy and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.